Welcome back to Personalization Outbreak Podcast. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the future of higher education and how access and technology will play a big role in shaping it. Now, higher education is changing faster than ever before. With new technologies, leadership styles, and ways to access education, where does that leave higher education and its future? Now, our guest today, Jeff Brown, has a lot to say about these topics. He's the Dean of Geese College of Business at the University of Illinois. Jeff also serves as a professor of finance and the founding director of the Center for Business and Public Policy. See, Jeff spearheaded the launch and growth of the online MBA program, which now accounts for roughly 10% of all online MBA students in the United States. Together, we'll be talking about how online courses are changing traditional education models and making it more accessible to everyone. Now, before we get started, please click the like button below, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and social media at Glen Yopis. Let's get started. The 2022 season of Personalization Outbreak Podcast is brought to you by City of Hope, a world leader in the research and treatment of cancer, diabetes, and other life-threatening diseases. City of Hope has been ranked among the nation's best hospitals in cancer by U.S. News and World Report for over a decade. Learn more about City of Hope at cityofhope.org. You are listening to Personalization Outbreak, a podcast about the collapse of traditional corporate standards in today's more personalized world. I'm Glenn Yopis. I'm a leadership strategist, author, contributor to Forbes, and founder of the Leadership in the Age of Personalization movement. On this show, I'm interviewing executives across multiple sectors to find out how the balance between standardization and personalization can exist. Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've been really looking forward to this. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So, Jeff, I understand that you served as a senior economist with the White House Council of Economic uh, Advisors, and you were working at the White House on September 11th, 2001. Tell us about that experience. Sure. So this was um, in the first year of the Bush administration. I'd gone there to work with the CEA, primarily there to work on Social Security issues. And um, I was just heading into the office that morning, uh, a little bit later than usual, and uh, had the uh, radio on and was hearing about what was happening in New York. Um, Little did I realize that uh, by the time I got to the White House, uh, both uh, of the World Trade Center towers had been hit. And as I was walking into the Southwest gate uh, of the White House, um, Secret Service uh, started getting extraordinarily active. And one of them yelled out to the others that we had a plane incoming to the White House um, with an ETA of about 90 seconds. Um, At that point, I figured it was over. uh, But I, I, after freezing for just a few seconds, I decided to run into the old Eisenhower Executive Office Building, where uh, there were a bunch of my coworkers, were uh, to try to to warn folks. Uh, that plane ended up, you know, maybe thirty seconds after I heard that hit the Pentagon, um, and uh, it was a it's a day I'll never I'll, I'll certainly never forget. Um, you know, I ended up driving home past the Pentagon after we helped evacuate the building and so forth, and. Uh, yeah, obviously a very historic day, a tragic day, and uh, one that's pretty burned into my into my memory. I could hear it in your voice, Jeff. I mean, how does a day like that change your perspectives on, you know, just how you approach life and leadership? Yeah, you know, I've been asked that question a number of times. It's always, it's in some ways, it's hard to answer because, you know, it's part of your life experience, and you don't know what life would have been without it. But it certainly made me, uh, you know, extraordinarily grateful, first of all, to, uh, you know, the, the heroes of Flight 93, who I, I think were, were still in the air when this was all happening and were either heading toward the Capitol or, or toward the White, the White House, um, certainly felt enormous uh, sympathy for everybody who lost loved ones that day. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it makes you want to really appreciate life and not waste time and, and to, to really make, try to make a positive difference in the world. You know, people forget, but in the weeks after that uh, tragedy, um, people were so incredibly kind to one another. I mean, even driving, there, there wasn't as much traffic on the, the roads of Washington, D.C. in the weeks after, but, you know, people were who were normally cutting each other off, were letting each other in and waving and everybody was wearing their American flag lapel pins. And we really came together in a time of tragedy. And, um, um, you know, those days after, I, I wish we could recapture some of that. I, I fear that uh, as a nation, we've become a bit too divided. And, and as a leader in higher ed, you know, I view my role as being one that is about bringing people together and creating opportunities for folks rather than trying to divide us. Well, Jeff, in, in the short time I've had a, the opportunity to get to know you, it's clear that your intention around what you do and how you do it is extraordinarily uh, genuine and uh, you care. And one thing is to care. The other thing is to act on the things that you care about. And you did just that when you uh, published your position paper titled, It's Time to Transform Higher Education. And uh, if for those that are listening, uh, download it. It is one for you that will, that will give you pause. Uh, it will give you insights, and it'll make you really think about what matters, uh, not just in your life, but in the future of those students that are dealing with this transformation as we speak. So what is the purpose of higher education? I think it seems to me as if that definition has taken on a whole new meaning. Yeah, so uh, obviously there are different views on that topic. Um, you know, if we go back to the classical uh, liberal education you know, the idea is to make us better, uh, more rational, more thoughtful, more informed citizens. And that has benefits not only to the individual receiving the education, but also to society at large, right? Um, to teach us that there's a bigger world out there and, and to understand large concepts, to think about the world's problems and so forth. Increasingly, um, given the pace of technological change uh, happening throughout the world that is um, accelerating very rapidly, um, higher education is also just, a, it, it's just becoming more essential and less of a, you know, this is a really nice uh, luxury for uh, a small segment of society and much more a, of a necessity for people to be able to thrive and to take care of their families and feed their families and as well as solving the grand problems of the world. And so there's a role for both traditional uh, liberal education. I'm a product of that myself, uh, but also um, uh, more lifelong skills-based uh, education and training that is available to people at any point in their lives when they need it, essentially on demand. And that's, I believe, the transformation that really needs to take place. We're working with a very old model, uh, and that old model is not as well suited uh, to the, the needs of today's um, uh, citizens. What are you defining as those needs? And where uh, did higher education go wrong in perhaps identifying uh, those needs? Yeah, you know, I don't think it's so much that higher education went wrong as it is that it has just been slow to adapt um, in part because, you know, if you really step back and think about it, if you if you look at any list of the oldest institutions in the world, and these includes things like, you know, the Catholic Church or what have you, you will find a number of universities on that list. They've had enormous staying power in the world because we meet a fundamental human and societal need of of creating, disseminating, and preserving knowledge uh, that can be passed along through the generations. The problem is that, that we designed all these institutions at a time when the rate of change of knowledge was much slower. I mean, if you think back to when Harvard was founded in the 1630s, and then it was about 60 years later, I believe, that William and Mary was founded at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. And the body of knowledge that existed uh, in that 60 year time difference, it wasn't all that different. I mean, what they were teaching in the 1690s wasn't so different than what they were teaching in the 1630s. Well, think about today, where let alone 60 years, it only, you know, six years, six individual years is enough for people's 
education to no longer be cutting edge and up to date. Just to give an example of that, you know, six years ago in our college, we were not teaching as a core discipline, you know, what I would now call business analytics or data science. That's now part of our core curriculum because it's become so essential in just about every business occupation. And so students that graduated just a few years ago, even the year that I became dean in 2015, may not have learned that. But that's not it, it, it. So, again, it's not that we somehow went wrong and made bad decisions. It's just that universities are are very established organizations. We have systems of shared governance that cause us to, I think, make very wise and thoughtful decisions, but not always very quick and agile decisions. And what we need is more quickness and agility uh, so that we can serve the needs of today's workforce uh, better than than we've been doing. So what what if there's one fundamental thing that you think uh, needs to change about higher education, what is that? Well, so I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit on the answer and, and, and fold a couple of things into the into the answer rather than just one. But so first of all, look, we all know that in the United States over the last several decades uh, that the cost of education has skyrocketed. It has gotten increasingly out of reach. Uh, for you know, middle class families, let alone uh, lower income families, on a global scale, uh, there are literally hundreds of millions of people around the world that need access to high quality education. And what we've built up over time is a model that's very geographically isolated or centric. So there's small regional schools and colleges and universities and so forth, but um, they're not operating at scale. And therefore, they're operating at a very inexpensive, uh, excuse me, a very expensive level. And what we need to do is to what I call democratize education by taking advantage of the technology that we're blessed to have and expand that technology, use that technology to expand uh, our educational offerings to be less expensive to work around people's work lives and family lives, to reach people who are not fortunate enough to live in an area where they have access to top scholars and top universities. Those could be you know, rural areas in the United States. They could be other countries that don't have the, the envy of the world university system like we do. Uh, and so it really is you know, the IMBA that we introduced um, in 2016 is, is really, I think, um, an incredibly important event and kind of a watershed event. But it's it's the start uh, and, and uh, nowhere near the the end goal of, of where I think we as a country and as a world need to go with our education system. So, so Jeff, how do we democratize uh, education without overly standardizing? it? Yeah. So one of the great things is that um, it, it may seem counterintuitive at first, but. Um, when you're operating at the scale and with technology, you can actually reach more people and do a better job of individualizing it. So let me just give you some examples. Um, one of the things that I think we need to do is get out of this box that has been around for at least 800 years that says that the credential that matters is a degree, which is a four year or a graduate level, a one or a two year or more. Um, Thing, and that's the piece that we're saying the person has done all this work and these are the skills that they have. And what we need to be thinking about are sub-degree or, or um, less intensive credentials. These could be certificates um, or other kind of you know, digital badges, things like that, that basically say, hey, look, I really need to learn finance or I really need to learn uh, business analytics or, you know, I'm using business courses, but it could be in any field. And I want to go and I want to um, learn sort of the cutting edge material in that area, have some kind of a recognized credential for doing so. But what that then allows me to do as an individual is to say, you know, I don't necessarily need to go back and spend two years getting an MBA or whatever the case might be. It might be enough for me to take three courses in these areas that I really need right now to to reach that next level of excellence in my in my current job. And so I can individualize my educational needs to where I am in my life, where I am in my career. 
and it becomes much less of a one size fits all. Come to campus, spend two years, take these courses. Um, and, uh, and we've tried to design that in not just in terms of your ability to choose content, but also when you're able to jump in and out, um, you know, we've designed scheduling flexibility, all kinds of things into this program uh, to really make it more accessible. So, Jeff, what can your peers learn from your own experiences of, you know, not just leading, but spearheading lots of this transformation? What would you advise them? I mean, we all know uh, it's much like healthcare. You know, these industries are regulated to the point where it almost feels like we're limited in what we can and can't do. I mean, you've made a lot of progress. And I say you, you and the institution and the team around you. But what, what, what could you advise or your, your peers that are trying to do similar things? Well, the first thing I would do is just try to motivate them from the standpoint of saying, you've basically got three choices. You can lead, you can be a very fast follower, or you can just become irrelevant because um, you know, any institution that is reluctant to embrace these new approaches and new technologies really does risk becoming, you know, the VCR or the, uh, you know, the cassette tape uh, in terms of how we deliver uh, content and, and education. So from a motivation standpoint, I'd say, you know, get started now. If you can get started yesterday, do so. Uh, fortunately, you know, the, the pandemic was a horrible thing on so many levels, but one of the things it did do is force a lot of institutions to um, overcome a lot of their initial relux reluctance mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of teaching in an online setting and using some of these technologies. Now, not all of them did it well, but at least it got their foot uh, in the water, dipped their toe in the water, and, and hopefully they can build upon that expertise. The other thing I would say is that when you go down this path, it would be a mistake to think that all you need to do is take what you were doing in a face to face classroom and just videotape it. If, you know, a lot of schools at all levels, kindergarten on up through colleges and universities kind of did that during the pandemic. And I'll just say it was not a particularly successful experiment for those that did it that way. What we have learned is you really need to design the content and the delivery of the course. You need to break it all down and redesign it for the medium that you're using, in our case, um, uh, in an online setting. And I'll, I'll say one other thing, and it is um, I often use this analogy. I don't actually remember where I heard it the first time. Uh, when the motion picture was invented, um, what, what created Hollywood was not just taking a camera and sticking it in the back of a live stage theater and filming the, the stage performance. That wouldn't have been a particularly good experience. Instead, they developed their own genre, their own art form. And there are, you can tell the same story on a stage or in Hollywood, but you have to do it well. You have to play to the strengths of the medium. And that's true with education as well. So Jeff, thank you for that. I mean, I think everyone right now uh, needs to find ways to be more interconnected and interdependent, and especially in industries like higher ed, who's you know being faced with so many unknowns. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, who can benefit most from, uh, from higher education? I mean, I know you talk a lot about the importance of access in your position paper. Well, so... You know, the, one of the things that drives me, and, and I've been fortunate, uh, I've spent the last 20 years as a faculty member and as dean at a public institution that was one of the original um, land-grant universities. And so the idea of access is kind of in our DNA and in its core to our mission. And we take that mission seriously, and we take it through a global lens. And again, what I would say is, first of all, there are people all over the world from all socioeconomic and racial and ethnic and, and, and nationality backgrounds and so forth, that can absolutely benefit from higher education. The problem has been uh, that we've either made it too difficult or too expensive or erected too many barriers. Those barriers could be, I just don't have a lot of great choices in my 50 mile radius. It could be that it's just too financially expensive for me. It could be that, uh, 
you know, I've got a family to raise and a full-time job and, and it's hard for me to um, fit into a rigid work schedule. Um, all of those things matter. Or in the case of uh, a number of developing countries, wow, I'd love to get a degree from a top U.S. university, but, you know, maybe I can't get permission to travel there. I have trouble getting the visas, whatever. We've essentially demolished all of those barriers uh, by through through intentional design of our program uh, to to truly make it accessible, um, you know. Look, I I I agree with those who say that we shouldn't be forcing college upon everyone. What we mean, what what they mean by that, and what I agree with is that depending on um, your circumstances, your interests, uh, your aspirations, and so forth, um, there's a lot of great careers out there that um that are trade focused or things like that where you don't necessarily need a four-year college degree that doesn't mean that you couldn't benefit from some of the education that we offer um and uh i like the idea of thinking that we should be putting content out there that is helpful to everybody uh, regardless of their career i mean look my i had a um you know my brother was a firefighter before that he was an electrician uh, always been in, deeply involved in the trades, and you can have a wonderful career in the U.S. as a as a trades uh, person. Um, in that case, they go through their own training and 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 so forth. But many of them end up uh, starting their own businesses. You know, I've got a neighbor uh, in Illinois who uh, he and his son have a, a small electrician business together. Well, guess what? They don't teach you about you know, finance and profits and accounting and all that kind of stuff when you're working with a journeyman to become, you know, to, to become an electrician. But that's knowledge that's valuable to you in running your business. And, and, and I think it's important that we make those opportunities available to everybody without requiring them to sign up for a multi-year degree. Yeah. You know, Jeff, as we kind of as we wrap this up, it, you know, it's been it's clear to me that the emphasis of uh, your institution and the way you lead is to you know, meet people where they're at uh, and recognize that we can't limit uh, humanity to access to things that really strengthen humanity, especially at a time where we're dealing with such immense polarization. So I really appreciate uh, your insights. They make a whole lot of sense. It's important that we get this message out because if there's one thing that I think we're both tired of is that we keep talking about things, we're not acting on them enough. And you're you know, you clearly represent someone who is acting. Uh, your institution seems very engaged and committed uh, to this vision that you've casted for them. And I really uh, honor the fact that you've spent some time with us uh, to talk about those things and, and, and just what the benefits will be uh, long term, not just for uh, the individual, uh, but also to society at large. But I've got to ask you one final question, and we didn't talk about this in advance, but I have a seven-year-old daughter, Jeff. What is it? What's higher education? What's the higher education experience going to look like for her? Well, I think it was Yogi Berra that said, uh, I don't make predictions, especially about the future. So I won't say what it will look like, but I will tell you. Um, so my children are a bit older, but I'll tell you what I think is really important is that. So for starters, children need to learn how to learn in multiple environments. Like I know the pandemic was a painful time for lots of school age children, but um, they're going to need to learn to navigate in a world where they have both face to face interaction as well as online interaction and increasingly going forward, you know, virtual interactions, whether it's in the metaverse or whether it's using augmented or virtual reality. And so having getting exposure to a wide range of learning modalities in addition to a wide range of, of fields and materials is gonna be really important because I think um, the, the, the more agile that someone can be in how they learn and understanding how they learn best, uh, I, I think there's gonna be a rich set of opportunities available for those that are sufficiently self-aware in that regard. I think in many ways it's an exciting time because I think we can lower a lot of barriers uh, to folks, but at the same time, there will still be a case in which the opportunities will be greater for those that have more flexibility and, and um, the ability to adapt to different learning environments. 
I don't, by the way, uh, I do not predict the, the demise of a traditional four-year on-campus education for those who want it. That is, I think, you know, the traditional college experience, it's not for everybody, but it is something that's still very attractive to those groups who can make it happen because it's not just about the, the formal learning. It's about, you know, sort of coming of age and, and, and learning to live on one's own. So it'll be there if that's what she wants. But the point is, it won't be the only option. Yeah. Opportunities are everywhere, yet few have eyes to see them. You see them, my friend. And it's interesting what you said giving people the opportunity to learn through different modalities. We don't have to wait until my daughter goes to school to start doing that. And I sure. think that's a big lesson for everyone. And I also think that this is perhaps why higher education got stuck in standardization, because we thought that that was the only way to learn. With this world of technology, there's so many other different ways to learn. So congratulations on IMBA. Continued success. And Jeff, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. And as we end every show, when you lead in the age of personalization, you will see things that others don't. Do what others won't and keep pushing when prudence says quit. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Personalization Outbreak. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. If you enjoyed the content, visit ageofpersonalization.com to check out our free streaming video series and learn how to get involved in the movement. I'm Glenn Yopis. I wish you a good day. And remember, without strategy, change is merely substitution, not evolution. Learn more about City of Hope at cityofhope.org.